Thanks for joining us today. Sorry, we're getting started just a little bit late here. So I'm here with Sunil. Hey guys. Today we're going to be talking about time series data and predicting spot prices. Uh, and I'll let Sunil talk a little bit and then maybe I'll go into depth on, on how the spot market works and what spot prices are and what spot instances are. Uh, I wanted to take a couple moments to say uh, it's been a very busy few weeks for me and also for Sunil. We've been planning for reInvent, trying to, to get everything set up and ready for you guys. Uh, I am happy to say that we will be doing quite a bit of Twitch coverage from reInvent. So whether you're attending in person or whether you're attending uh, remotely, I would suggest following the Twitch channel uh, in November to get all the updates for everything that's happening. I'm a little yeah, bit under the weather, so I'm probably not going to talk as much as Sunil will, but I'm going to kick it over to him and see what he has to say today. We've, uh, we've been doing a lot of uh, Twitch stuff as well. Uh, so, um, yeah, so we were uh, talking about the rope. Event, but we're going to have a hackathon for autonomous cars. So we just uh, uh, we, we just uh, had a Twitch stream uh, on how do you build that car. So it's going to be a four uh, um, four episode series. We just did the episode one at nine a.m. today Pacific time. So it's recorded. So go check it out. It's it's a lot of fun. Uh, there's a large deep learning component to it as well. Um, but today we are uh, going to focus on uh, time series modeling. Um, so we have a lot of um, you know, uh, interesting uh, applications here, right? When you think about uh, anything to do with like sensor data um, or sales forecasting uh, or uh, say you want to predict the power consumption in your house uh, on what trends happen. Right? So, so for those kind of applications, uh, uh, which are inherently time series data, uh, it, it will show you how to model. So today we're going to talk, tackle a very simplistic time series model because when you think about time series, right? Like there are always, uh, um, you know, periodic, uh, seasonal variations and anomalous events, uh, and uh, it's important to have all of that data captured if you want to uh, capture complex behavior. Um, so we'll, I thought it'd be taking like a fun problem like AWS spot prices, right? Like uh, they tend to be kind of, uh, you know, stable for some, uh, they have enough variations, but stable over a large uh, period of time. So I just took a slice, which uh, kind of makes sense uh, uh, to model a stationary uh, distribution and uh, tackle that. So Randall, maybe you can talk a little bit about what the spot market is for people who aren't familiar with it. Sure, I can also just demo it. So let me go ahead and yeah. switch over to my browser here. Um, so the spot market is essentially a way for you to get compute power at market prices. And what I mean, what I mean by market prices is uh, you are not paying the on-demand cost of the instance, you're paying the current market minimum. So there are a couple of different APIs, oh, excuse me, that enable uh, the spot market, but chief among them is the spot fleet API where you can request a series of different instances. Uh, say you need you know, so many vCPUs and so much RAM, you can say, I need this much, I don't care exactly which instance type I get so long as it's one of these, and I want you to find me the cheapest way of provisioning all of this capacity. Uh, and you can also do this with EMR, the Elastic MapReduce service. Uh, but frequently when I have to deal with a very large instance, rather than paying the on-demand cost, I will request a spot instance. So in this case, uh, let's say I want a GPU instance, like a G316X large. And the current spot price is, you know, one dollar. Uh, so spots is saving us sixty-eight percent over the on-demand price. And then we have pricing history, so we can see what it's been like. We can go for like the last month, and you can see there's a lot of different variations. So uh, you can set your 
spot capacity even higher than the on-demand cost if you want. And then when on-demand will sometimes return out of capacity, you can still sometimes get instances from spot. Uh, but normally if you have a required capacity uh, within spot, or sorry, a required capacity for a certain instance type, what you want to do is you want to get a reserved instance and then you'll be guaranteed that capacity. Uh, but we can look at the G38X large, we can look at the 16X large, and you can just see the, the monthly breakdown of how these prices have changed. Uh, in this case, I am just going to go with a uh, this G38X large today. I'll select that, which has 32 vCPUs, 250 gigs of RAM. And you know I can say I want 10 of these, I want a couple of these. And I'll say, go ahead and give me the lowest price one. So choose the cheapest availability zone. And I have no preference. And then I'll say, use automated bidding. So I'll launch all of that. Let me provision a terabyte or so of RAM uh, of storage just to uh, be able to deal with some models if we need to. And then I'll choose a key. And that's really all I need from there. Uh, and request is valid until tomorrow. So after tomorrow, or actually we'll say until Monday. After Monday, terminate the instances. And the really cool thing is on October 2nd, we launched per second billing. So with per second billing, you can, uh, you're, you're still being charged. Uh, you're, you're only being charged for the number of seconds that you were using the instance after one minute. So you no longer have to worry about trying to maximize the number of hours your instances are up. And this is true of the spot fleet as well. So you can get truly very cheap stuff done. Uh, and you can see my request is pending fulfillment. So it only took a second to, to go from uh, requested to pending fulfillment. And then it's fulfilled and I've got my instance. And that's how the spot market works. And there are a lot of uh, nuances in the spot fleet API where you can figure out exactly what the right kind of requests should be. And there are a lot of people also who try to, uh, there are a lot of people who also kind of like try to game the system because if we terminate your instance in the first hour, we don't charge you for that instance. So it is sometimes advantageous to make your bid as low as possible in the hopes that you'll be terminated at like 59 minutes and 59 seconds, uh, or 58 minutes and 59 seconds. And there are people who run entire workloads like that. Uh, that seems like quite a bit of work for fairly minimal savings, but maybe uh, maybe Sunil can teach us how we could do that today. <laughs> uh, that's that maybe not my uh, motivation and intent. It's, it's, uh, uh, but um, you know, do you want me to perhaps, switch it back over to you? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Perhaps uh, uh, you know it, it's more interesting, um, you know, other applications, uh, but also just forecasting. I mean, you could if you're thinking long term. Uh, uh, you know, there are different bid strategies, uh, but I would think this more of a interesting data set that you can work on and understand inherently how time series modeling uh, works. So, so that that's my motivation. Awesome. Cool. Right. Uh, so we'll we'll use uh, uh, we'll use this data set. So we've already uh, so went through API calls, kind of filtered. There's a ten day, essentially a ten day data set on uh, uh, spot prices, and I'm gonna post this on the Twitch channel. Um, yeah. Yeah. We're gonna follow. Yeah, great. I think uh, Randall already shared uh, the notebook, um, but I'm going to walk through, uh, you know, how we do this. Uh, so the data looks, um, you know, why don't we just take a little stab at, um, there you go. Uh, so you can see there's a timestamp, oops. Yeah, so there's a timestamp, and it tells me what instance type it was. Uh, we'll use the, uh, and then what was the, um, you know, um, the operating system, so Linux, Unix, uh, which uh, availability zone 
And then finally, the last column is the price, right? So what we're interested in here is just the last, first and the last column, uh, you know, the timestamp and essentially what was the cost at that uh, particular moment. Um, so, um, you know, I thought it'd be great to do this on a P2 Excel, which is again used a lot for deep learning, right? So it's an appropriate <laughs> instance uh, for us to do some research on. It's a useful one to, to have. Right, I mean, gaming deep learning with deep learning. <laughs> okay, um, so we've sort of talked a little bit about uh, recurrent neural networks uh, when we did some sequence modeling. Um, today, uh, what we're going to do essentially is a, a sequence prediction, right? So we're going to say, hey, this is what has happened, like at time x and time x plus 1. Let's understand what happens at time x plus 2, right? That, that's, that's what we're trying to figure out here. How, how, how do you, in your mind, differentiate convolutional neural networks from recurrent neural networks? Huh, good, uh, good question. So I'm sorry, I sprung that on you. No, no, that, that, that's, that's fine. Um, so convolution, uh, if you think about the de uh, what inherently it does is you have two functions. Um, so if you think about the data distribution and a, con uh, and a function, a filter that you define, what convolution does is looking at the overlap that you have with the distribution, right? So it's extracting features uh, from what the distribution looks like. So an image, right? An image is a lot of different pixels uh, and a certain representation. Now, if I create a filter uh, that, uh, let's say, um, you know, d does a blur, it's a blur filter. So it extracts, as we move the, the filter through our function, which is a you know, two-dimensional pixel, it extracts uh, the product of the filter that we had and the raw pixels. So we extracted the, uh, that, that particular feature. But with recurrent neural nets, uh, what we're trying to model is uh, inherent behavior, right? So we, uh, we, we have a bunch of sequences. What are the relation between the words and sequences? And can we model that to predict what happens next? So, so that's kind of, uh, so, so that's, that's what we're trying to model. We're modeling sequences and re repeated uh, 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 patterns. So what we can do is with a sequence uh, uh, model or a record net, you can do a one-to-one -one mapping. That's, you know, we have a single input that maps to one input, one output. We can do one-to-many, many-to-one, and so on. Interesting. But what, what's important here is uh, the sequence aspect, right? Like the sequence aspect is the most important thing here, um, which is why I have an equation uh, uh, at the bottom there. What it means is we are dependent. We are, we are dependent on the output of the previous step. Or so. So that that's that's in, the key here. In this case the previous step is not necessarily the previous layer, right? It's, it can also be kind of an adjacent item. Correct, correct. So it is, uh, if you had words together, right? So Randall is live on Twitch. Now, as you, uh, uh, like, it's important for us to know, right? And like say natural language processing, what are we talking about? Are we talking about Randall? So uh, we need to have that relation and things that happen before have an influence on things that are going to happen, right? So, right. so that that that's that's important uh, to be modeled. So, for for problems like NLP, there's a natural fit. It's a natural fit. Is it is it always? And I'm sorry if we're getting way into like the the weeds here. It's just is it always just t minus one, or does it take you know t minus five or anything like that? Oh, any any we can define the window size. Good question. Okay. Yeah. You, you can define an arbitrary, uh, uh, and this is where the recurrent aspect comes, right? Like, that's a good question. Ask me that in in, a, in three minutes because it's, it's okay. Be, uh, so, what what happens with these networks is 
again, there's a long chain of dependencies, right? Like if you're going to think about a, how do you design like a recurrent net, uh, but you sort of have this window. So you, you, um, you kind of say, hey, I'm going to take five words at a time, 10 words at a time, but ultimately it's a fixed one. What happens is the context may be out of that window that we define, correct? So it may not, it may not capture, maybe we talk about Randall is a good person and then, you know, blah, 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 and then he loves to, uh, you know, surf. Um, and now we, we, did, we can't quite get the he part, right? Like if our window is just five words, we don't know who we are talking about. Does that make sense? It makes sense, yeah. Yeah, so it's so that's kind of an inherent uh, problem with regular uh, recurrent neural network is uh, you might have long dependencies, long-term dependencies that may not be captured. So uh, what we end up doing in practice is use something that's called as LSTMs, which stands for long short-term memory. So long short-term memory. So it's kind of of like folks uh, uh, who have, uh, uh, you know, who can't remember, just have a short memory, like let's actually remember relevant things, right? Like just as humans do, we will get the gist of things, we'll, we'll remember all the important details, lose out on things that are not important. So so that's, that's what we do here. Um, so instead of breaking down, we, sort of have a statement machine. So we have an input, you have essentially four gates. So there's an input gate, there's an output gate, uh, there's a self uh, connection and a forget gate. So what happens is things that are not important, we're calculating kind of the weights and like saying, hey, that was important, that was not important. Like, well, let's forget that uh, thing that didn't happen at all. So it remembers relevant information. So you can think of this as like a memory cell, right? So there's a state that it captures uh, and we can use this and exploit this uh, so that, you know, we actually know we're talking about Randall and not some other, uh, or we don't have the context there. So this is useful for determining things like uh, verbs that are made up out of multiple, or sorry, nouns that are made up out of, of like certain proper nouns should not be translated. Like if I were to say um, Amazon X-Ray and then we were to send that into a translation, it would try to translate Amazon and try to translate X-Ray without realizing that it was a proper noun. But in this scenario, because it sees the two together, or is that is that a different set of problems? Uh, what you described uh, is just a regular recurrent net. That's correct. So you need to have the previous context to say what, what's going to happen next. Uh, but what I was trying to say with long LSTMs was they inherently help you capture long-term dependencies because it, it only filters out, it filters out all the things that don't appear a lot are not important and can remember things outside and, you know, have long-term dependencies and, that, and that, that's what I'm saying what is what is the threshold for the forget gate is it determined in each one of these cells is it determined it's a uh, so we again have a certain window and uh, the occurrence uh, uh, depends on the you know, data set um, but you know these are sort of tunable usually people will just throw the API and let, let the network define we we'll just control it at a high level um, but that actually brings us to next point is, remember, these are chained, right? Uh, if you kind of remember, so this is, this is, uh, there's a whole chain of these events. And the problem, what happens is, um, you know, we, we, we needed, we needed, we had linear networks now, there's a recursion. So, well, those don't, uh, those don't go well in hand with, Remember, we have to backpropagate, <laughs> correct? So, so what we do is we do a step called as unrolling the LSTMs. So what we'll do is we'll unroll them in the time dimension. We, we talked so, about this in our first episode, actually, unrolling. Right? Yeah. yeah, 
So, um, actually, I believe it was the second episode. Second episode, uh, you're right. Sequence, sequence modeling. But I'll just recap. So, what will happen is uh, we'll unroll the loop uh, and we'll say, hey, uh, I'm taking my window size that I'm looking at is five, so I'll unroll the loop five times. So we'll have, uh, you know, t minus uh, t minus five, four, three, two, one, right? So we have those five uh, five loops, unroll the loops or unroll the LSTM, so that we can we now have sort of a linear network. Gotcha. Makes yeah. sense. And then we can connect each of those nodes on where Correct. it's ordered sequentially. Correct. So, so the edge here is what we call as the hidden state. So the hidden state at each step captures what the model essentially or that particular cell has learned. And okay. are those nodes necessarily connected to the next layer or? Correct. The, okay. Those are connected to the next nodes actually. So the next nodes. As okay. you see here, right? So if we unroll the loop here or LSTM, so at x0, it's h0, h1, h2, and so on. So when we actually uh, compute the hidden states of the next layer, it'll be the sum. So it'll be the product of, so x is the input at time step t. w is the weights there. And then uh, we'll, use the, uh, we'll use the weights uh, of the hidden state uh, and the uh, and the value at the hidden state, the previous state. So we we'll use the output from the hidden state, the previous hidden state, and the weights. So we are using what we have at any current given timestamp, right? We have the current information. We'll use that, but we'll also use the uh, what we've computed at the previous step. So so that's what we need to remember. Do if we're using information from the previous step along with what we compute at this step. So does the HT, I mean, if we get to a point and the weight is you know, overwhelmingly negative, does the HT oscillate between positive and negative or does it have a general trend in a certain direction? Uh, it might be problem dependent. We need to visualize, we need to visualize that. Uh, but also, here's why LSTMs are interesting. Um, you talked about positive and negative, right? When we use a, 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 a RNN, right? So because we kind of unfold and things are, um, it might not capture all the behavior. They're more prone to uh, what we call as vanishing gradient problem. Uh, I don't know if you recall, what happens is as you back propagate, you're calculating the gradients uh, of each of the parameter, right? Uh, now, and we need to multiply. We, we keep multiplying these weights with the gradient uh, 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 with the weights, right? If it's close to zero, right? If the value of the gradient uh, is close to zero, and we multiply the, that with the weights, they just disappear, right? Right. So zero. So the subsequent way, subsequent gradients that we calculate are essentially. There's no gradient at zero, right? So it just stops. So we just stop learning at that point. Huh. And are there so, techniques that you use to kind of like filter out those values? Yeah, so RNNs are notorious to train, and that's why LSTMs are helpful. Because LSTMs help Let's forget us. forget this. Yeah, uh, yep, correct. Like they're not important things, and we can make sure that we're getting, um, you know, better gradients uh, that we can propagate and the network learns. Awesome. Yeah, and I, uh, I'll, I'll post a couple of links on, uh, you know, further readings on LSTMs. Hopefully this has captured, you know, some of the basic understanding. Uh, and as far as we'll see when we use it, uh, we just need to know the high level information and we should be able to use that. Um, so yeah, let's, let's actually start coding. Um, Great. So for this today, is my favorite part. yes, deep learning coding. Um, yeah, you can. Um, you should be able to run this on your laptop today. Uh, if you have the deep learning AMI setup, that's that's ideal. Um, but uh, we'll just need to make sure that you have uh, MXNet, so you can do. Um, 
pip install mxnet and then pip install. It should uh, actually mxnet install will pull in no as well. Yeah. So um, pip install. Uh, yeah. Matplotlib. And um, we'll need pandas. I think, yeah, th th this should be sufficient for um, today. Great. I have all of those things. Wonderful. Any good uh, data scientist or somebody who wants to explore should already have all of these. So load the data. So I have not downloaded the data, so why don't I Oops, oops. You're popular. Yeah, excuse me for that. Um, so I'm going to do is set and it downloaded. Fantastic. So import pandas, import. So yeah, no, uh, the usual stuff, right? So uh, matplotlib and matplot. Okay, all good. And uh, yeah, let me just make sure that um, I do inline plots and let's load the data, right? Uh, so data. Frame. I just want to point out for people uh, who haven't seen that before, uh, matplotlib inline is just some IPython magic that'll show all of your plots inline rather than opening them up in like a TK or or other window. So let's let's use the file here. Let me download as a CSV file. Uh, use columns. Uh, so remember, we we needed the first and the last uh, column. So we had five columns total. So, and the names, uh, let's call it date and uh, cost. Oops. Um, let me visualize that as well, right? So df.head. There you go, right? Um, so we got the date, we got the cost. But, um, you know, let's actually, um, I want to, let, let's actually see what the time series distribution looks like, right? Um, we're not concerned about the type in this, so that you just exported the types for P2 only? Yeah, I, it's already filtered. It only has uh, P2. Gotcha. There. Okay. I've already, like, I just simplified the data set. Uh, so we've not filtered. It's, it only has P2 Excel. Gotcha. Uh, and what we'll do is, um, I don't know if you saw, uh, we had the top, uh, we'll just need to rearrange them chronologically. Uh, so, uh, because we have, as you can see here, right, so it goes from 42, 41, 40. Uh, let, let, let's, let's make sure all that is aligned. Uh, otherwise, yeah. Um, and also, we need to uh, kind of um, convert, uh, remember like uh, we have this date format, so we need to convert that into essentially time ticks so that we can actually have it plotted nicely on matplotlib. When so, you say a time tick, do you mean like an epoch time or, or just an increment? No, it, it, it's, it's when, 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 no, no, this is just uh, the time at which the cost, right? These things, these values, yeah. these date values, yeah. Uh, so uh, I just need to, uh, you know, apply the date util parser. So date util dot parse uh, parser dot parse. Um, so let me import import date util parser. I think you have to so spell I'm util. Apply... Uh, and on on text equals it's dat. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
I normally use uh, a library sure. called Arrow for this, and Arrow will take like any type of time format, and it's very uh, uh, error tolerant. Yeah, I, I need to explore that. Um, so I'm just using the data util parser. What I'm doing is use the Python map function. I'm just mm -hmm. going to map and create all of that, right? Gotcha. So now uh, our data set is going to be all the costs. So uh, we define those values. Uh, we have two columns, right? So I'm, I'm going to take the second column here. Uh, so this should give us uh, all the data set. So the data set dot shape. So that's the amount of data we have. Um, so what I'm going to do is try and plot now. So I plot plot. Uh, this is um, the time. So this will be our uh, x-axis and our y-axis is our data set. There you go. Cool. So that's our, uh, you can look, it's like around May, uh, yeah, May 4th, yeah, end of May to beginning of April, no, April to May, sorry. <laughs> I also, this is just me going into like Python nerdery. I'm pretty sure in pandas, there's like a, a, a column.apply or like data frame.apply that you can use, which would save you the step of like, bringing the values out of the columnar data store in pandas and then putting them back in. But it probably doesn't yeah, actually save uh, you any you time. Can, yeah, you, you can do that, yeah. There's a data frame. Um, Dot um, apply. Yeah, I, yeah I'm, I'm just blanking out on that. Uh, Don't worry about it, yeah. <laughs> too many, uh, yeah, there's too many ways to do the same thing. Um, but I, I, we're not going to do, do much with pandas, which is why you know, kind of extracted it gotcha. out there. Okay, um, so let's, uh, yeah, let, let's actually like now convert these into sequences, right? So remember, this is continuous data. So we need to convert uh, this into a sequence problem. So what we're gonna do is essentially uh, apply our window, right? So apply our window across the time series, and we're gonna do, one step look at prediction. Okay. So we're going to take uh, all the previous values in the window and predict time t x plus one. Okay. Uh, so essentially, what we'll say is any value at time t x is actually dependent on t x minus one, t x minus two. If our window size equal to two. Right. Right? Does that make sense? Yes. So if you look, ignore the timestamps here, we'll just take the sequence. Uh, what we're going to say is, if you look at, uh, you know, 20, uh, this is Tx uh, T2, right? So the value at T2 is determined by value at T1 and T0. Gotcha. Okay, so um, okay, so let's let's actually, but also um, you know it's always a good practice. Uh, remember, we don't have a scale of values defined here, so it's good to use something to normalize the data. So luckily, um, you know, SK Learn uh, from Scikit has a pre-processing, pre-processing. Uh, it's called a min-max scalar. We'll just use that. And is that just going to bring everything down into a more yeah. normal? Okay. Zero, zero and one. It'll be a value between zero and one. So we'll just say uh, data set, um, you know, um, so remember, uh, we, we just need to give it in the right shape. So I'm going to uh, reshape the data uh, into um, uh, so length of essentially length of data set comma one and we'll declare a scalar function here min max 
Hybrid max scalar dot scalar. Uh, sorry. And uh, the uh, the <clears throat> it's called uh, feature range. We'll just use zero to one. Right. So we'll do data set uh, scaled data set equal to uh, scale dot fit underscore transform. Um, so scalar is so scale, yeah. Yeah, scalar fit transform data set. Scalar with an E, not um, an A. Sorry, one second. That that was just a joke, sorry. Oh, you, did, you didn't spell anything. Sorry, sorry, yeah. <laughs> I, I uh, yeah, I'm using a remote monitor, so uh, like, did I? Okay. Yeah. We had NumPy. From NumPy and Port MPA. It did feel right. Like when I typed that, something was off, but uh, it didn't feel right. <laughs> I should have known I got it wrong. So you can see the values, right? So we've transformed. Uh... Right. Just a... because. Um... Oh, sorry, sorry. Um, scale. See, that didn't feel right as well, which is why I checked the values. Yeah, there you go. All right, so they've been transformed. Does that make sense? Yep. So now let's uh, align the data. So align the data. Um, so what, what we want is our x, our x, uh, x is, remember, x is the input, uh, and y is the label, correct? Right? Gotcha. So that, that's the general terminology. So X is just our scale data set, and Y will be data set. So, um, sorry. X. So what we'll do is we'll do some shortcut. What we want is, say, for all rows, we want the second column. OK. So, X, come on, um, I think you might need to delete the space after the uh, and scale data set. Sorry, comma. Yeah, no, no. I missed the comma. All right. So, um, so I'm, I'm just like, uh, I've just taken uh, Y as just uh, all the it's moved um, it over one. Yeah. So they kind of offset, right? So right. six two is um, yeah. Okay. Um, so now let's let's actually convert. Uh, what I'm going to do is a, a loop uh, to pick the first um, uh, n values, right? So um, we're going to have whatever our window size is. So let me fix the window size. Our, we'll call it sequence length. So sequence length is 2 in this case, right? Because we're using t x minus 2 and x minus 1. So something like range 0 to length of uh, uh, the y minus the sequence left, right? So you're going to need a. Uh... For i in range. For i in range, yeah. Um, so we can kind of take, uh, like, you know, underscore x uh, is x of i to i plus the sequence length, right? So we're uh, like that, we want, we want that many uh, uh, items. To compare yeah, to items in. Yeah, so x, and then you want to guess what uh, y is going to be? No. It's just a sequence of that, right? Like, it's, 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 it's right at that price. Uh, and then uh, let's just have uh, our data arrays. Uh, so 
underscore x, data y, dot n, underscore y. So let's just have our data x, data y. You just um, used a semicolon in Python. I want to point that out. I know, I know. And uh, I, I don't I think just, data y is like, this is like some C struct stuff you've got going on with data y. I just declared all in the same line. It's just um, shorthand. So let's actually look at uh, data x of zero, come on, data. So data y of zero, right? What do you, so what do you expect, right? So we, we've got those values where our x is two values, which proceeds to the third value. Does that make sense? I'm, yeah, it does make sense. So x is a range, x is zero and one, and then y is two, is that? Yeah, so, um, so what we have done is we've taken tx is zero, plus, uh, and we've said tx one, and we've said it's equal to tx two. Or not equal to, but that's what you're. Correct. I mean, by yeah, other, yeah, yeah. It, it proceeds to so, and the next what we'll have is t x one, uh, comma t x two will be equal to t x three. Gotcha. Right. By, or by equal to, I mean they're just equating. So we can yeah. we can just do that check here and. We'll see is I think you need a one instead of an exclamation point. There you go. See? Six yeah, three yeah. two six one three six oh cool. So our, our window is is still two, but we're only moving in increments of one. Yeah, it's a sliding yeah. I mean we're saying the sequence length on the X the inputs is two, but the stride we take, the we we're moving uh, is the next. So we're not missing out on data points. Gotcha. Because it's a continuous sequence, right? Mm -hmm. so remember, it's a continuous sequence. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, okay, let's actually uh, define our iterators. So train uh, iter equal to mx dot i o dot and the array uh sorry and the array iter so remember it takes uh it takes uh like our um you know training data it takes our validation uh so this is the label data so train y i've named them differently but uh I, i'll i'll come to i'll fix that so bat size, you know, that size, and then we'll say shuffle equal to true. Now I'll come to why we need to do that. Okay, so we've defined the iterator, correct? Um, and um, what, what, what we need to do is split the data. Remember, like, uh, we, we have just one continuous data set now, correct? Okay. Uh, but we need to have uh, we need to have multiple data sets. Uh, but by that I mean you have you need to have your trained set and your validation set. Right. Right. Okay. Sorry. Uh, so let's say our um, total size equal to length of data y, right, data y. Um, actually, let's just say, yeah, train size is 0.7, and test size equal to data y. I mean, I'm just spelling it out. Uh, oh, actually, Let's actually not make a mistake. Let's just do. <laughs> right. And I'll just. Just for sanity. It's always good to have types. 
Um, yeah, so um, we can have like continuous uh, data points. So uh, I'm just gonna do uh, train X um, and test uh, test X, uh, which is gonna be something like data X, right? Data X of uh, to the training size and then data X of yeah. Right. Oops. Does that make sense? There, uh, kind of? Yeah, I'm following. Cool. Same with Y, right? So Y. We we we've done this particular portion of uh, the training a few times before. The, the splits, right? Uh, actually, uh, one I think thing test I think size is, is needs to be the. I mean, we don't need the test size, right? Like we just uh, um, we just we're using the uh, um, array indexing for that. I just did that for uh, clarity. Ah, uh, okay. I'm just gonna, yeah. Do the NumPy array uh, as we get. Because remember, we like to deal with NumPy arrays, and not lists. Lists are, you know, uh, sometimes uh, Pythonic uh, or folks uh, Pythonically inclined, it's easier. I'm gonna be so, right back. I'm gonna run, go grab a glass of water, but you can keep okay. going. Yeah, so I'll wait for you while we declare the validation iter. So we'll do val iter. Remember, this time we need the test set. So test x, test y. We don't need to shuffle. I'll explain what we do. Yeah, for folks who are tuning in, we're building a time series model. Uh, we're gonna try and predict uh, the spot prices uh, for uh, uh, AWS instances. So we'll take a data set that's uh, for, uh, 10, essentially a 10, uh, 10 days worth of data, and we're gonna try and predict uh, uh, how, essentially the next price. Uh, so this is the data set uh, that we're working with today. Yeah, please feel free to ask questions on the channel. Um, so let me, let me declare, let me start building the network. So network, okay. Let's say, uh, you know, the usual. So we'll declare the symbols. I've got sim. Uh, var, data. Um, okay. Uh, so what I've done is I actually done, did a shuffle, like Renault. So what happens is we we break all the time series data. Uh, we don't have a continuous sequence. What we do is we break it, break them out, uh, because ultimately we're just saying sequence one and sequence two lead to sequence three, and that is independent. Uh, we don't need to have the chain. We don't need to feed the data in exactly this format. Correct. Correct. So they are pairs. They are pairs. Yeah. 
Yeah. So you, you can certainly do that, uh, but then they get a little harder to train. So what we'll do, remember, we had the problem with words in the first episode when we did with uh, sentiment analysis, right? Not all reviews were of the same size. So we padded it. Sorry, I, sorry, I, I have been muted for a little while, everybody. Um, I, I had to run and grab a glass of water, so I, I just unmuted myself so you should hear me now. So we have a couple questions from the, uh, the Twitch chat. So Adam Delaney asks, how should I think of the prediction capability related to the window? Uh, let me, I'm still, I'm reading his next question as well. Uh, no, so we're doing a, just a sequence. It, it, it it's not anything to do with quadratic or cubic. So that's the second question. Uh, the the asked. If the window is two, uh, are you doing a linear fit? Window is three, are you doing a quadratic fit? Sorry, I just wanted to read the whole question for the people who are not looking at the chat. Sure. Um, it is, it, it's, it's just, a. Uh, it's just how much context you want to give uh, for it to predict. That's all it is. And the, the larger the window, theoretically, the longer it takes to train? Yes, uh, but also in certain cases, you might get better results because uh, it's a function, uh, it's, it's, a, it's got long-term dependencies, right? So you need to that understand the whole... data distribution, correct. So, uh, Let's say uh, you know you want to model a more complex problem. You might need a longer window size, right? Like where uh, uh, it, so it, it really builds up to that event that you're interested in. So if you're doing high frequency trading, for instance, and you're trying to build a model around that, you might want to bring in you know a whole slew of data points from the past few days. Correct. Correct. Or uh, yeah. So your window size may be. Uh, you know, um, like let's say the last minute rather than just last few seconds. Gotcha. Right. Okay. Um, yeah, so where did we go? Okay, so we need to do a little bit of uh, before, uh, let's look at like the MXNet uh, LSTM interface. So, uh, there's something called the LSTM cell. So, we'll end up using this particular API. So, let me try and copy this over so that easier for us. So I, I've never actually looked at the the docs for MXNet because I just use the help function in uh, in Python and then I get all of this. And so every time I'm unfamiliar with the method, rather than like going to the, the web page, I'm just like, okay, let me just help. Yeah, I mean, sometimes it's uh, just helpful. There might be examples. Uh, so the MXNet IO like has a example code, which uh, may not be in the Python docs. Um, I, I think so. The examples show up in the in the help docs too, which is why it's, it's like okay. super useful every time I run that method. Yeah. Um, so what we need to do is, uh, uh, it's to look at the LSTM cell. We actually need to feed it in uh, a format, uh, you know, which is TNC. So TNC will be, um, so T represents the sequence land. C, C for time, right? So time steps, it's also called time steps or sequence land. Okay. Okay. Uh, N is the number of samples we're giving. So this is equal to the batch size. Okay. Okay. And C represents the number of dimensions, the so dimensions in the hidden state. All right. Make sense? 
Gotcha so far. Okay. So I don't think we executed it this time. Yeah, that size. Okay. I don't know. I'm gonna select smaller bat size of sixteen. Um, again, uh, no, no real intuition there. It's just uh, you're uh, thinking you know, that we can like see that. what's happening. Yeah, we'll see. It seems like we we don't have a lot of data, right? So I don't. Want, I, it doesn't make sense for me to train with uh, longer, a uh, lot of batches. So I'll take a shot at that. Um, okay, so, um, so train x dot shape. Okay, you can see that, right? So we have the total number of samples, uh, two comma one. Uh, so this is our shape. Uh, we we kind of, we want to make sure that we reshape this uh, so we can use the transpose function so that we are converting into the TNC. Uh, format that we want. So mx.sim.transpose. Uh, so we'll do um, data, comma, this equal to, uh, we'll just swap. Okay, um, so once you've done that, let's let's define our, so we'll, we'll use two, uh, two layer LSTM. So we'll just have a simple um, you know, two layer LSTM and see what happens. So we'll do the LSTM cell. Uh, we'll say the number of hidden nodes. Uh, we'll just have, we'll, we'll go with the simplest network, right? Just with five nodes. Uh, again, arbitrary, uh, should be a simple problem. So, okay, let's, let's. Let's do that. Now, do you um, want to change the variable for LSTM1 as well? Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. I only changed the prefix. Um, what happens next is we, we actually, remember, we, we need to unroll uh, the LSTM before we can train, correct? So it's right. does an LS roll function. So, uh, so LSTM unroll. Uh, so unroll. Let's look at the API, what unroll goes. Yeah. So it takes the length, uh, essentially, the number of steps to unroll. Uh, do you know what we'll do here? What's the value here? Is it going to be five, or is it going to be the length five. of the? So remember, we are unrolling the time dimension. So it's the number of time steps? Correct, which is, in this case. Oh god, is it three or two? <laughs> no, we use the window size. What was the window? Window size and time steps were pretty much similar. We use two, right? So okay. we'll unroll it two times. Yeah. This is like being asked a question in college. I'm so afraid. <laughs> uh, so we're going to say a length equal to sequence length. So that's, our, uh, that's what you can do. Inputs is data, right? So that's our variable. Um, and um, what, what we need to do is merge the outputs uh, from each of the hidden states. So it says uh, merge outputs, right? So yeah. returns list, otherwise it concatenates across the time steps. So we, we really want it to be concat, like we're saying, uh, both those time steps matter to us. So let's merge those outputs of those hidden states. Make sense? OK. Again, you can try without merging the outputs. So we, we are saying it's like it's, it's dependent you, on. When you say merging the outputs, is it just going one and then the other, one and then the other, or, or is it combining them? Like It's concatenated, yes. Concatenated. Um, and then we'll just specify the you know layout. We don't need to. We just uh, we'll just say a TNC, right? So we're going time step, batches, and uh, number of hidden states. 
and we'll do the same uh, for LSTM2, right? So we need to do the same, but our input is going to be something different, uh, correct? So we don't need to, uh, we'll, we'll still merge the output, rest remains the same. But LSTM1, as you unroll, uh, gives you uh, the output, uh, say L1, it also gives you the states. What we will feed in is the output from L1 uh, into unrolling into L2. So, and you can think of L2, you know, we get, we get the same. So we get two outputs, right? So we are interested, we're chaining. Remember, remember yeah. the chain that we create? So we have chained this now, um, and L2 is, um, so, so that's the output we have. But what we're interested is the state. Uh, so the first time we need the output, the second time is the state. State is where we have the learned representation. So our output is going to be, uh, again, we need to, uh, we basically need to get the output in uh, something like um, something like this, where uh, it'll be um, hidden LSTM2. So this is kind of the format we'll get uh, the output in. So in our case, it's going to be five uh, because we had uh, so the C stands for the number of dimensions in the hidden state, right? So we'll have five uh, because we have five in the, just to avoid confusion, let me just do this. Okay. So we're gonna have two different, Oops. okay. So let's do a reshape. Um, reshape the output. Uh, in this case, it's L2. So you can see here, states. The new state of the RNN after unrolling, this type is the same symbol as the output of the begin state. So we'll use, it's, it's an array, so we'll use the first state. Um, shape, minus one indicates uh, the bat size, we're not going to touch the bat size, uh, and uh, it's just a way of, we're not reshaping the batches, we're just saying, hey, it's the same batches, and uh, reverse, because we went, we went this way uh, uh, on the other direction, so we need it flipped. So that's, that's when we get the output. Now, Remember, like, uh, it, it's not a classification task, right? So what we're doing is trying to predict, and this is, in some ways, this is a regression task. We okay. just need a single output, essentially, like, uh, so mx dot sim dot linear regression, um, linear regression output. Um, like that, that, that's, that's what our final output looks like. But remember, we have all this representation. We always have a fully connected layer uh, before that. Uh, because we need, as we learn all these parameters, we need something where all these nodes get connected and we reduce the dimension and then feed it into our output layer. So you'll always, almost always see a fully connected layer before the output layer. Makes sense. L2 reshape. So L2 reshape. Oh, oh, sorry, I already had it. As yeah. Oh, well. um, in our case, like, you know, the number of hidden uh, is one FC. And uh, I want to call it FC. What, what is the FC in this place? In this case, is like it's fully, fully connected. connected. Yeah. So remember, like 
uh, in our previous networks, right? Like we had all these CNNs and other staff that did all the filtering. They learned all those dimensions. Yeah. But, but I, I guess my question is, is it's not so much a, a, a conceptual question as it is, if we're already specifying that we're fully connecting this, are we saying like the, the previous layer, that like L2 reshape that we're coming from is fully connected? Is that what we're passing in to? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let me visualize, let me visualize the network right after I finish this up. Uh, so data equal to FC and then, um, yeah, that should be good enough. Uh, MX dot with plot. Um, this is our final network. Okay, so hopefully, oh yeah, this is name. Shape is not defined. Um, shape. Um, trying to trying to recall. Uh, these syntax. So one should be one to one. No, doesn't like. Oh wait. Yeah, there's a. Oh, shape, shape here. Sorry, there you go. That's what it was complaining. Um, man, I'm, uh, do you remember, uh, Randall, the, uh, API? I don't, but I'll look it up really fast. MX. Viz. I think it was, no, oh, it's whiz.plotnetwork, sorry. Plot network, yep. See, this is where the cheat sheet is handy, guys. So <laughs> there you go, there's the MXNet cheat sheet, which I wrote. <laughs> uh, you know, for obviously the reasons, because I can never remember syntax. Um, so we've got little uh, RNN, LCM networks here. Um, yeah, we've got for a lot of fun examples uh, that you can really. Uh, work on. That says how much we have math. There you go. Um, not the most. Yeah, so I don't know if you can see this uh, correct. Let's go all the way down. This is a complex one because uh, you know, the LSTM unrolls. I <laughs> you switched because the screen is frozen for me. Uh, no, I haven't. So you're still on the cheat sheet? Oh, no, I, I switched to my... Uh, yeah, your, your, your screen is totally frozen. Oh, now it's all caught up. Okay, I'll wait. Yep. It, it's working now. It's all caught up. Okay. So you can see the data, we transpose the data. And then, uh, you know, this is the LSTM cell, which has got its own. What is going on here? Uh, okay, guys. Uh, my chime has just crashed on me, so give me a second here.
Uh, sorry about that. I don't know what exactly happened, but Chime just sort of died. But you can see my screen, correct? Uh, yeah, we're back. OK, so let's actually declare the network. Um, so data names are, uh, I mean, it's, it's default. So context equal to MSI. Yeah, I'm just going to use it as a CPU for this one. I just want to show folks uh, how to, uh, we, I mean, this is a small problem, right? So. Uh, um, epochs equal to 20. I don't know. It's, it's, it's worth trying and checking what happens. Train data equal to train underscore writer. Um, so eval, eval data equal to well underscore writer. Right? So our um, initializer, I mean, I'm going to use the default initializer. I mean, um, we can skip it. I'll, I'll, I'll add it just in case if uh, something needs to be overridden. Optimizer. Adam's always a, the most sophisticated of optimizers these days. I'm sure Adam Delimey appreciates the, uh, the Adam optimizer. <laughs> uh, learning rate. We'll pick the, the quintessential um, E power minus three. <laughs> we can play with it if, if it doesn't work. Uh, eval. So eval metric. So you know this is this is the really important uh, part. So remember we used to use like um, accuracy as our metric. We can't quite use accuracy, right? Like it doesn't give us the real uh, data, but it's a continuous output. What what we kind of want is a mean squared error. Right, so uh, if you kind of think about two signals, like differences between two signals, we usually use root mean square as the metric uh, uh, to uh, you know find that. So we're going to use the mean square error as our distance function. Uh, it goes to and uh, let's do the import. Logging, um, yeah. So we, we need to let's let's make sure that uh, you know we're logging uh, as we go. So logging get logger uh, set level. Yeah, I just have a debug level. Oh, oops. I entered too early, but it's always good to debug. So it says, uh, say softmax label not found, right? So um, you know this is this is when uh, we have not explicitly, uh, you know, um, named our layer. So uh, by default, so we would have had before. to pass in but, the name. Yeah. So just because softmax is like the most common, uh, um, you know, thing that we use. So it's, by default, it just gives it that name. So we'll just rename it. Saying the regression output, but also it says uh, softmax undercore label label. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it adds the label by default. So. Yay! Look at that. That seems to be working. Not working. Look at that, right? So look at our training accuracy, right? It goes from 0.02 to 004. Look at that. That's a reduction in uh, um, order of magnitude. Yeah, order of magnitude. So it feels like our network is, you know, has learned something. Well, that, 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 that's looking promising, Randall. Okay. And it changed very quickly. Yeah, I mean, small it's, amount it's of small data. data so. Set. Um, so let's actually do our, you know, test prediction. So, uh, I mean, just for fun, we'll, I mean, we don't have like a test set. So 
Uh, we'll just reuse our validation. Um, so we'll do model.predict val iter. And um, th this should give us like, uh, so if we do um, like the error, so we'll do is uh, test pred, um, sorry, my, uh, minus uh, the actual value, which is in um, test. I forgot what it is that. What I think we test? put it in test. Yeah, test y. Test y, yeah. Uh, I mean, I didn't... We changed to an interchange validation uh, test, so I always uh, forget what I had named it. Um, so this is essentially the mean square error, right? So uh, that, that, that's, that's what I am defining here. Uh, so this gives us the, I'm not happy, and the array type not predicted. Uh, that's because I, we're, so this is what As, happens. Uh, yeah. Just to kind of show people what the error is all about. Uh, so look at the format, right? So we are an ND array, MX ND array, and we're trying to use a NumPy operation. So um, all the stuff uh, we do are in MX and ND array. So we need to kind of change that and get the NumPy out of it. Okay, and then. Um, there we go. Oh, yeah, that's wow. a, a little, low number. Feels like a low number. Okay, but I mean, because it's always relative, right? So it's always good to check what you started with. So at Epoch 1, we were at 0.01, and we are at 0.001, right? So we've had a, we've had a reduction, um, a significant reduction. So I am uh, sort of confident that uh, we are doing good. Okay, so let's um, uh, let's actually try and just plot this part. Um, so to do, do um, it'd be interesting to to extrapolate and have this model plot uh, or or build on top of its own predictions and just extrapolate the plot out from there and then compare it with like the next day's data. Yeah, yeah. So the extrapolation is a little hard because uh, what it's captured is kind of, kind of captured the trend, right? Mm -hmm. so, so it's captured mm -hmm. what's happening. It, it's only doing one look at it, a prediction. So if there's an onward trend, it only is going to build on top of that onward trend. Right. Um, and especially because so, we shuffled the data set. Correct, correct. You, you yeah. think, so for, for something, I keep going back to this, like the high frequency trading thing. For the high frequency trading thing, it seems like shuffling is, is something that's actually adversarial towards the process because you are looking for those macro trends as well. Yeah, I mean, the shuffling makes the data independent, right? So it, it gets it more robust. Uh, so it, it has an idea of usually when things are in the uptick, there's always a downtick, right? Like, so it learns that, uh, hey, whenever it goes beyond like four cent, 40 cents, it's gonna go back. So, so it, it learns, so, uh, so that's, that's what is important. So, you know, we need to capture these peaks, but we, we, we need to learn as well as when we hit the peak, uh, we're gonna go down. Gotcha. Uh, so, so that needs to be learned. So, I mean, I can't do a, a, actually, let me, let me convert the values, right? So let's say, uh, test. Back into dollars. Yeah, uh, yep, yep. So test plot data um, is uh, scalar dot inverse transform. Uh, in, in this case, it's our test spread. So we can, we'll just take a view of that. Right, so here are the values. This, so these are the real dollar values uh, that we predicted. Uh, so you can sort of see 
Uh, test X, but test Y. Um, yeah, we're a little off for the first few uh, samples here, but that's okay. That's why we should plot this. Um, now, um, so we have the we have the ticks data, right? So ticks, um, and I'm just going to try something and say test. What am I missing? Good. Oh, there you go. But have the shape. So we have oh, to like take off the last two. Yeah, sequence land. So. There you go. So that's what we predicted, Randall. Right? So. So I think you have to go back. <laughs> You have to yeah, go back no, up to the top and compare the two. I know. I'm going to align the graph. Uh, let's, let's, let's have some fun. Okay. Um, what I'll do is I'll shift the plot. So, um, okay. So plot dot plot. So we'll 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 just do um, we'll do the uh, data set. So scale data set. So it's called data set, right? Plot dot plot. Uh, ticks, data set. Yeah, so this is our real data. Mm -hmm. But th these are on different scales. So let, let's actually align, right? So remember, like, uh, let's align and see what happens. Uh, it, it, lib can auto align the, uh, the y axis, right? It's just the ticks that we have to bring into. Correct. Um, so I'll just add. Yeah, it's a little tricky. So um, what I'm going to do is just add empty sequences and just make everything the same size. Oh. <laughs> uh, so something like, let's say, plot equal to mp dot empty, uh, empty. Hey, you can just do something like this. So <laughs> it gives it an empty uh, data set. Uh, I think data set is a list. Uh, we'll, we'll let it throw errors. Here's the fun part, right? Um, I'll just put a not number. Uh, so t uh, plot uh, of uh, length of uh, train y. Um, actually, negative, yeah. Because we, we, we skipped the last two, right? So, All right. So negative sequence land uh, equal to what was our prediction here? Test plot. So test plot. In the in the sequencing, do we have to do the length of train y again? My oh oh oh, you're just saying take off the last two. Yeah yeah. So real data, and then we're gonna do plot dot plot. Um, yeah. We can just do ticks here because it's uh, yeah. um, it's the entire data set. So label, sorry, I think I need to yeah, yeah. label equal to uh, Fred. Um, yeah. Uh, legend. Whoa. <laughs> Pretty good. You see that? That's impressive. So what you're saying is yes. I can save a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. So let's uh let's just look at the effects of uh you know, just for fun, like how it learns. I mean, it'd be fun to create a visualization of like uh, how right? good it is over a number of epochs. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, the, those so the epochs, the height, the batch size, these are all like hyper parameters that go into the creation of a particular like training right. model. And CMU yeah. just did this huge thing on spot instances, uh, where they tested like millions of different hyper parameter combinations. Yeah, this is actually better than I imagined. <laughs> um, I, I 
just want to show people this is real and <laughs> so we'll just go with uh Oh, there you the go. The right? Oh, that yeah. That's one Epoch. That's one Epoch. So, there you go. This is real. This is two Epochs, guys. That's what learns. I like that. That was two Epochs. Wow. It's, it's already pretty darn good at two Epochs. Yeah. Yeah, so that's uh, that's that's uh, time series modeling. Um, so you could um, so fun uh, data set. There are some fun data sets on power consumption, uh, UCI power consumption data set. Um, uh, so this is a good data set. Uh, this is actually multivariate. Um, so if, in in this case, we just used one dimension, right? So we only used. Uh, the uh, single C, like it was only dependent on the previous cost. So if in the power use case, you have the active power, reactive power, uh, intent voltage. So you can get all of that uh, as uh, your learning stuff, uh, um, you know, uh, multiple variables that you learn to predict the uh, final outcome. Interesting. Well, uh, Adam Delimey just said, got to run. Sorry, this has been really fascinating. I'll agree that it's been really fascinating. Um, is there anything that you want to kind of close out with? Uh, I know that we were hoping to get to some land the deployment and stuff yeah. like that today, but I unfortunately will not have time to complete yeah. that. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah. I, um, um, so the code will be posted on um, um, the uh, uh, GitHub link, uh, the DL Twitch series. Uh, so this is like, this is our season one finale, I would say. <laughs> hopefully More or less. This been, yeah, hopefully this has been good and uh, maybe we'll restart after reInvent. Uh, but yeah, send us, send us ideas, send us problems that you want us to work on. And, um, you know, maybe the next time we'll have Randall uh, lead uh, uh, one of the episodes uh, with deep learning. That's and, my goal. Uh, see, uh, yeah. I've been studying up. Awesome. So uh, one of the things that I'm interested in doing is uh, in the weeks leading up to reInvent, I intend on spending a little bit more time on Twitch doing some more live coding, uh, both with deep learning and outside of it. So I'm going to be talking about some of our newer services like Glue and how you can use those to kind of shape data for machine learning. Uh, because a lot of the pre-processing that we do is uh, cumbersome to, to work with uh, for each data set and you can build these little recipes in glue and have them run whenever somebody adds something new to the data set uh, I was thinking about doing some fun stuff with the USA spending gov data set and I'll, I'll show you guys a little bit about that uh, in the next few weeks but I wanted to thank snail for coming and presenting all these times it's been a fun little series and I hope we can get going on some other stuff sometime soon Cool. Thanks, guys. Uh, yeah, we'll see you soon. Bye, everybody.